All right, so here we are in our third uh, portion of Carrie, and I would, again, this is one of those videos where I would strongly recommend you read before you listen, because a lot of the big stuff, obviously, that happens in the novel um, occurs in the 60 or so pages that we've read for this class. We have the culmination of the plot between Chris and Billy to, you know, trap Carrie at the prom. We have the dumping, the spilling of the pig's blood, a uh, very famous, iconic spilling of the pig's blood on Carrie and Tommy. We have the ensuing chaos that erupts as Carrie White decides that she has finally had enough of what she has been subjected to in high school for years and years, well, I guess grade school for years and years and years, and this in the beginning of the aftermath of that. We also have a great many different voices that are brought into the story at this point, different uh, interviews, different reports, different transcripts that give us multiple perspectives on this one very significant event. It's a fascinating instance for a number of reasons. Um, and if we step back and just think again about what it is that uh, novels can do, I think one of the things that happens in this part of the story is that one of the things the novel does is it, it confronts us with a monster. And it puts us in the situation where we have to consider the monster and monstrous actions and what it is that causes these things to happen in the first place. But before we kind of get into um, any of those things, let's actually take a slight detour and think about some of the climactic moments in some of the stories that we've read this semester in our Seagull Reader. When I use climax, it's a term that's often used when discussing stories um, discussing plot structures, it tends to reference kind of the big moments when all of the narrative tension, all of the narrative developments, it's the point towards which all the action in the story has been driving, kind of comes to some kind of fruition, fulmination, uh, resolution in one way or another. And as we've been going through Carrie, you've undoubtedly noted along the way, there's been a lot of foreshadowing, a great deal of foreshadowing comments about, you know, something happens, there's some event, there's some calamity that happens at some point associated with prom night. And then eventually, a couple hundred pages into the novel, we actually get to that event and we actually see what happens. And we have this kind of climactic eruption where the school's lit on fire and all these murders occur in, in the town. It doesn't have to be that dramatic. If we think about some of the climactic moments in the stories that we've read so far this term, we'll see that the climax is very much a part of both short and short stories and longer stories. So I'm looking at the little table of contents here. If we think about something like uh, What You Pawn I Will Redeem, that wonderful ending, uh, where we have Jackson Jackson receiving what he claims is his grandmother's regalia and then dancing in the street, right, is this very profound symbolic gesture for him. If we think about Sonny's Blues, everything kind of moves up to the brother going to see his brother, excuse me, uh, perform in the club and at that moment coming to realize, coming to connect with his brother in ways he's been struggling to do throughout the entire story. If we think about Cathedral, largely a story about two individuals, or at least one individual, our narrator, who has all kinds of preconceptions of the blind man, and yet they come to this moment of connection at the end of the story. If we think about The Swimmer, a slightly different series of events, but all along the way, there's these indications that things aren't quite as they're being described, and then finally at the end, we see our narrator, uh, Nettie, uh, return home, and it's made very clear that his perception of reality is not correct. You could do the same thing with a number of other stories. I won't run through the, all of them. Obviously, uh, the open boat, the climax is they finally get to land after pages and pages of struggle, and what happens uh, as the boat capsizes and one of them does not make it. A rose for Emily, the death of Miss Emily, the investigation of her house, and many, many others. Um, the gift of the Magi, the revelation that both, right, have given away the things they prize most so they can buy a present for the other person. And obviously, let's just go all the way up to Shiloh, where we have the eventual visitation of the Civil War site uh, after it's been long promised, long suspected. And once they get there, 
they find that their marriage has crumbled or is essentially crumbling is maybe a best case scenario. And Bartleby as well gives us a climax with the death of Bartleby in the tombs. So this idea of a climax, okay, this idea of a massive major event that most of the action, most of the plot in the story has been working toward is something that is fundamental to literature, fundamental to fiction, certainly the kinds we have been reading in this class anyway. And one of the ideas I want you to get right now is that it really doesn't matter so much the length of the story. Okay, it could be a very short story, it could be a very long story. There's the same desire to get to this moment, this significant moment near the end of the story. Now, there are a lot of other little things that happen at the end of Carrie, so we could certainly debate and argue, and I think that would be great, where it is the climax of the novel occurs. I'm right now pegging it with the explosion at the high school, but you'll notice there's a lot of things that happen, at, happen after the high school. There's a very important church scene uh, that happens in a little bit um, that you might say is the climax as well, but we'll leave that aside for a moment. The fundamental idea right now is just to recognize that structurally there are a lot of similarities between short stories and novels. The primary difference is that in the novel the author simply has more time and space to include different kinds of scenes, provide different kinds of development for the characters, and potentially to give us a broad and or broader view of a society in a particular place and time. It's one of the reasons why I think the end of Carrie is so significant, or the portions that we're in now. The disaster is something that happens to the entire town. You'll notice this. The high school's exploded, but then she also starts to roam around uh, and blow up gas stations and other things as well. So it, it begins to involve the entire community, right? It's not just the high school. Um, so if we think a little bit about stories and their, their DNA, okay, the basic parts of their stories, which we have spent some time thinking about in this course, we can, we can reduce, and I don't mean that in a negative way, but we can identify some of the fundamental components. We have these main characters. We have their kind of social perspective. We have the development of the character over the course of the story. Clearly in Carrie, it's a very negative development from, you know, mousy, uh, uh, marginalized, abused individual to monstrously violent, uh, vengeful um, uh, teenager. Uh, so there's this, there's this, this real change. Well, when we read something like Carrie, you know, one of the questions that we might have is, you know, why read something like this? You know, what's what's so important about this? It's a fantasy novel. There's a lot of offensive language. There's a lot of offensive people. There's a lot of unkind things that happen along the way. Why take the time to read a book like that? Well, there's a lot of answers. Probably one of the most honest is there are a lot of offensive things in real life too, and you better get ready for them. Uh, but, but beyond that kind of, you know, kind of brutal assessment of the world that's presented in Carrie, one of the things that it does, I think kind of masterfully, and it'll continue to do this as you get further into the story, is you have to, when you read Carrie, you know, you're probably going to be struck with the idea or the question of, well, you know, do I have sympathy for her or not? Or is what she is doing, is it, you know, explicable or not? Do the people in the high school deserve that or not? Now, most rational people would say absolutely not, right? You know, like, like you know, there are all kinds of ways to explain what's going on here. And you don't ever, um, you don't ever, you know, justify, you know, violent retribution against people. That's not, a, that's not a rational thing to do. One of the things the story does, though, is it has us think about how monsters become monsters, because what she does, I think, is most of us would probably agree, is absolutely monstrous. But how is it that people get to that place in their life? And when I say that, I don't mean it in a way where we would we would justify monstrous behavior ever, tolerate, encourage, allow, forgive even. I don't think that's even necessarily required under what I'm saying. But the novel has us think about how do people become who they become. And what are the forces that do that? And one of the things that I think is so is so beautiful about the novel Carrie, which may sound like a weird word to use, given how violent and vulgar so many of the characters are and the events are, is that for all of those aspects of the story, one of the things that this story does is it makes a pretty good case for how it is somebody becomes a monster in society. 
right? And how they get there is they are somebody in society who along the way is continually marginalized, set at the edges, and continually disrespected, right? Continually disrespected. It's okay to disrespect Carrie White. Culturally, it's an acceptable thing to do. And as you read this story and you think about Sue Snell and you think about Tommy and you think about some of the other people that she encounters, one of the things you need to understand is that if you were a student at Chamberlain High, it's very likely you would have participated in the humiliation of Carrie White. Now, you may certainly disagree, and I hope, I hope that's the case, but I raise the point because it seems to be something these students do without really a second thought. It's okay to do this. She's on the bottom rung of the ladder, the, the social hierarchy. We don't need to pay attention to her. In fact, it's fun to beat up on her continually, which is what happens to this character throughout this, throughout this story. Well, how do people get there? How do you get to a place where you are so kind of ready and willing to beat up on somebody who is um, in that position in a society, right? Well, one of the ways you get there is you never stop to wonder about that person. Who are they? Where do they come from? And most importantly, from the perspective of literature anyway, what is the world like from their point of view? What is it like for them to experience day-to-day humiliation, real humiliation, as described in the story. What is it like to be taught that you essentially have no future but this depressing, degrading path forward? What would it be like to have that point of view? And to see no way to escape from it. What would that be like? And you know, whenever you raise this point, you have students kind of instantly say something like, oh, I'd want to help that person, and I'd, I'd want to help that person, and I'd do whatever I, I can to help that person, which is a wonderful sentiment, but we also recognize there are potentially many people in society who are in this awful, marginalized position, and if people were really as quick to help people out as they are to claim whenever you raise these concerns, we probably have a lot fewer of these kinds of people in society, right? So one of the things that Carrie does is it gives us a fictitious but interesting representation of how somebody becomes a monster. Carrie's transformation from kind of marginal nobody to horrifying eventuality, right, is one that we recognize could have been stopped, potentially, at any number of points along the way, right? If, if somebody had stepped in at school and helped her, either a peer or a staff member or a faculty member, she could have been helped, it, potentially. If somebody had intervened in the home, I mean, you think about the description that's given of Margaret White, like screaming for her daughter and all the violence that's associated with the home. If somebody had stepped in and helped out, this could have been prevented. If somebody at the prom had, instead of laughing, tried to help her, this could have been prevented. But what we see in Carrie is this massive social failure, right? This complete inability on the part of the people at Chamberlain High to intervene, to help carry out, to help her, you know, deal with the stresses that are going on in her life. That is now, but that's not to say that they're guilty, right? Because the last thing you'd want to do in a situation like what happens at prom is blame the victims. That's not very rational either. But what's important here is you get an understanding of how it is people become the way they become. And that's very different than saying that a person is just simply good or simply bad, right? It's a good person, it's a bad person, we'll just get rid of all the bad people and then we'll just have good people left, right? That's a really non-specific way to think about society and the people who are in it. People act as they do in society for any number of reasons. And if we don't understand those, then we don't know what allows for these kinds of things to happen in the first place or how it is they could be prevented 
you know, going forward. So when we think about carry and we think about all these events leading up to prom, one of the things I hope you get and one of the things you really want to pay attention to is kind of the step-by-step -step development the character makes on her journey from, you know, being humiliated in the shower, essentially, which is where we kind of start with her to the point where she decides to kill everybody at the prom. There's a really interesting moment. For me, this is the key moment in the story where she is waiting for Tommy to come and pick her up. And if you go back and look at that passage, what you'll see is that she has a thought that if he doesn't come, if he, if, he stands, if he stands her up for the prom, she's going to have a very violent reaction. She's going to make something explode. She has that thought even before she gets to the prom. And for me, that's one of the, the key moments in the text. Because one of the things that that tells us is that even before she gets there, even before they dump the pig's blood on her and all of that humiliation starts up, she has made a determination, which is that she has been pushed as far as she can be pushed. And that if she's pushed any further, her reaction will not just be a reaction in kind, but a reaction with explosive consequences, literally, in this case. right? So she's come to that determination in her own head, which to me tells me that she's very aware of what she's doing as she destroys the school that she's in. This is a story that we need to take seriously because we live in a world where not only are people marginalized, but we have a great deal of anxiety as a culture about school safety and about violence at schools, which in the past 15, 20 years has become a kind of horrifying regularity. We have these extreme events that occur at schools. There are a number of ways to approach that social issue, and it's not my intent to really get into that in this video. But one of the things, one of the reasons Carrie is so important and should be read, I think, there's a bunch of reasons why it should be read, but one of the reasons that it should be read is it shows us how somebody can lash out when they're essentially a wounded animal from the beginning. Um, somebody who's been marginalized and hurt and made to feel humiliated, made to believe they don't matter. How such a person can react. And again, I, I offer that not as a, ever, as a justification. So I hope you're hearing the difference between what I'm saying. I'm in no way justifying. But what I am saying is that the novel brings an awareness to how people interact with each other and the significance of our interactions with each other and the importance of everybody having an opportunity to feel like they're part of a community, right? Carrie White's behavior suggests that she has been so removed from the possibility at school, at home, and just in life in general, from feeling like there's any positive path forward that she only can imagine one terrifying eventuality. Let me back that up for just one second and kind of get to the main point that I really want to get to at the end of this video. In this class, we've talked a lot about literature and the value of literature and how professionally one of the things it lets us do is it lets us look at people who live lives that are different than our own. That's important in terms of professional development, but there's also a far more fundamental value to that, which is that Literature also allows us to see lives that can show us potential for how we might live, what we, what we might pursue, how we might treat each other that might not be evident in our day-to-day -day lives, which is all kind of a long, complicated way of saying that stories give us hope. Stories can show us other ways of living, other ways of being, other ways of interacting with people, or simply a broader understanding of why, pe why it is people act the way that they do. So when we read a story, um, you know, I would not say that this is one such story, but when we read a story, when we read literature, when we engage a text, it can provide us with a broader view of reality, and that's usually hopeful in the sense that it makes us aware. There's other ways to live. <coughs> There's other ways to be. There's other things to aspire to, perhaps, than the things that are immediately in front of us. The great tragedy of Carrie 
is that her world is so reduced, right, that she literally can't see beyond what's happening to her in her day-to-day -day life. She sees no hope. And we get that in a real explicit passage where she's imagining her future with her mother after high school. She sees no change. She just sees continual degradation, which is a tragedy. It's a travesty. Literature gives us hope because it broadens the world that we live in. It shows us other kinds of people, other kinds of situations, and other things we might potentially desire that we might not be aware of in our day-to-day -day life. So for all those reasons and for many others, and we still have a ways to go with Carrie before we get to the conclusion, I think this is a wonderful novel. I think it's a timely novel. Um, I think it's a very sad and very upsetting novel. But literature sometimes, oftentimes, has to have us focus on things that we're uncomfortable with if it's going to expand our understanding of the world. So anyway, I would kind of throw that out there. There's a lot more I wanted to get into in this video in terms of symbolism and motifs and themes. There's a number of them in Carrie. I won't drag this one on, but I will talk about them as we get into the final portion of the book uh, which we're getting into next time. So I hope you enjoyed your time with this section of Carrie. Uh, I look forward to seeing how you address today's writing prompt.